This episode is brought to you by Roundtable Group, the experts on experts. We've been connecting attorneys with experts for over 25 years. Find out more at roundtablegroup.com. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today at Discussions at the Roundtable. Today, my guest is Rob Hanfield. He's the Bank of America University Distinguished Professor of Supply Chain Management at the North Carolina State University. He's also the Executive Director and Founder of the Supply Chain Resource Cooperative. You have been an expert witness in supply chain management, but if you can share a little bit more about your background and how you first became an expert witness. Sure. So, um, you know, I've, I've studied and worked in uh, supply chains for uh, more than 30 years. And, um, you know, I, I, I enjoy publishing, of course, in, in academic journals, but I also really enjoy working with business in general. And so I've always been kind of different as an academic in terms I, of really, really enjoying working with uh, companies and, and learning about what they're doing. And um, about 20 years ago, I founded something called the Supply Chain Resource Cooperative. And this was just that, a way for students and faculty to work with business uh, to create uh, innovation and thought leadership in the area of supply chain management. And so we've done more than 700 projects with companies as part of our MBA and undergraduate uh, curriculum at NC State. So, uh, you know, I've always been really interested in, in what's going on. And, and what's fascinating is this field is always changing. There's always new developments, new technology, uh, new issues that are coming up. And, um, you know, that has led to a lot of really interesting uh, engagements, uh, which I'll be happy to share with you on this podcast today. How did you first become an expert witness? Yeah, so, so you know, I think um, ex good experts are ones, obviously, that know their the field in and out. Uh, I was first approached by um, a very large pharmaceutical company that asked me to testify in a suit uh, that had to do with capacity and, and the, their ability to manufacture product to meet a market demand. And interestingly enough, that was with the first H1N1 pandemic uh, many years ago that occurred around the 2010 area. Uh, you know, since then, uh, I, I do a lot of work with, with contracts and managing relationships between buyers and sellers. And, and what I've observed is those relationships have been strained and they've led to more uh, lawsuits that involve uh, patent law around supply chain software, uh, disagreements or, or problems in production uh, related to uh, contracts and uh, breaches of contracts. And uh, as a result, this is uh, this has really increased the demand for my expertise as it pertains to these buyer-seller relationships in supply chains. And so I found myself, you know, very busy as of late, uh, especially since the uh, the COVID pandemic. There's been a real uptick in supply chain problems. COVID has obviously changed the platform for a global economy and supply chain. In the last few years, has there been anything in particular that has shifted your approach as an expert witness in this field? Yeah, well, you know, I think one of the um, one of the big moments for me occurred during during COVID, and uh, I have a colleague who's who's in the Air Force. Uh, he's a contract acquisition officer. He also has a PhD from you know, my alma mater, Chapel Hill. Even though I have an NC State uh, logo on my shirt. And uh, he um, he invited me to join something called the Joint Acquisition Task Force. And this was initiated in March of 2020. And the idea of this task force was to help find sources of PPE that were in short supply across the country. And they had tasked the Air Force to do this. And he said, look, you know, we can't pay you anything, but we really want you to, to come and help us. I said, sure, I can help. Well, Little did I know I was going to be, you know, on the phone and on Zoom calls from eight in the morning to late at night, you know, with with FEMA, with DHS, with the National Stockpile. And, uh, you know, I was advising them and, and we actually had grad students doing research for them on trying to identify sources of PPE for healthcare. And, you know, this opened up my eyes to the fact that we were completely and wholly unprepared for this uh, for this pandemic, completely unprepared. 
And ironically, in 2010, I had written a report for IBM that said planning for the inevitable was the title of it. How do we how do we get prepared for a the next pandemic? I think that that report gathered a lot of dust because I don't think anyone read it because we were completely unprepared. And and uh, you know that allowed me to also understand uh, how um, you know how vulnerable we are as a country uh, to uh, outsourcing that we've done so much of to places like China and India, where you know we are wholly dependent on these countries for our drugs. For our PPE, for our healthcare supplies, for our semiconductors, and I think it's it's really driving a, a big shift. And uh, we wrote a book about that called "Flow: How the Best Supply Chains Thrive." That talks about how some of those changes have occurred, and that just came out this past year. If you could talk to me a little bit about your expert witness experience, like what you know now that you wish you knew the first time that you were asked to be an expert witness, or those first few years, are there things that you have? wish you put in place as far as organization or networking or the questions to ask an attorney, you know, even in that first interview, what, what would you do differently that you know how to do now? Well, you know, I've, I've learned a lot, obviously, in, through my expert witness experience uh, around supply chains. And, you know, I think the first thing that I always look for is, um, you know, do I feel good about this position, right? Do I feel good about taking a stance and putting my my stake in the ground, uh, defending this client for this particular issue. And uh, if I don't feel good about it, it's it's not a good fit. You know, as an expert witness, you always have to tell the truth and you have to stand by your principles. Have, you gotta know when to say no. You've gotta know when to mm -hmm. stand back and say, you know, I have a conflict of interest and I don't agree with that. So. I think it's important to stand by your principles uh, you know, throughout any, any type of engagement. Are there certain questions that you come in to those first phone calls with attorneys before you're retained that you want to know? I mean, of course, the matter of the case, you know, the details. Right. But how do you organize that information to know if you're the right fit? Yeah, I, I think an important part of the question is, you know, how can I help in this case? What is it that you'd want me to testify on? And if it's outside the scope of what I know or what I feel comfortable about, then you know it's not a good fit. Um, but if you, you know, and, and a lot of people approach me, you know, being an educator, they're saying, look, we want you to help educate the jury. And that's my sweet spot. I mean, I, I love to teach and, and educate and um, I'm really good at it. And I've written several textbooks for uh, undergraduates. So I know how to explain things in a simple, direct way. Mm -hmm. And so if it if it has to do with you know making people aware or or and I, I I ask those questions. I mean, what is it you want me to do? Is it to educate the jury? Is it to you know frame this issue? Describe to me exactly, you know what you'd like me to testify on in in my report. Now, when you write your reports, um, is there a particular flow? Do you write? The majority of it, or do you have a team behind you to help organize and collect the data and then present it? How how do you approach writing your expert witness reports? Well, I, I think first of all, yeah, I think data is always important, right? And and so I like to frame the report by saying, okay, what are the questions that I'm being asked to answer? And let's be very, very clear on the scope mm -hmm. of what it is you want me to answer. And and getting those questions right is important. Um, and then, you know, once you get those questions, you can say, okay, well, um, you know, I need to start with some basics. So I need to start with what is a supply chain? You know, why are supply chains important? Where does your stuff come from? Mm -hmm. So kind of providing an overview of, of, you know, what's happening overall in the big picture and then focusing down. Okay, now let's look at this particular supply chain. Let's look at this particular issue. And how do these principles apply to these general print these general ideas? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, if there's if there's data available, uh, you know, I'll, I'll look at data and I'll do an analysis. I've, I've done that in the opioid cases, uh, and in some cases, I use PhD students that are. Uh, we have some brilliant PhD students at NC State that are really really good with large data sets, and running you know statistical analyses and and modeling and so forth. And um, 
and I and I rely on them to help me in in some of those cases because they're they're much better at it than I am. I'm I'm a good writer and I understand data, but I'm not always good at manipulating it. Right. And so exactly. so it really is a team effort in that case. Any advice that you've received over the years that you've taken to heart and have utilized on the stand? Yeah, well, you know, there's there's two types that I've done. I I do a lot of depositions and I do um, you know, testimony in some cases. And um, you know, I think that you know, the number one principle and I always enjoy, you know, the coaching sessions by attorneys because they're they're really good at mm -hmm. coaching people for depositions. So I always pay pay attention and and uh, really listen a lot to what they have to say so that that we can, uh, you know, I can prepare myself better. And, and, you know, there's just a few basic principles, I think is number one, always tell the truth, you know, tell the truth. Uh, number two is, you know, stick to your lane. Don't try to, you know, speculate or don't try to, to guess on something that you don't feel comfortable about. And it's okay to say, you know, I don't know. That's that's perfectly acceptable. And that was a big aha moment for me, you know, when, when it was, you know, they asked me and I didn't know the answer. And I said, I don't know. And that's perfectly okay to be able to say that, especially in the deposition. Have you been prepared um, for that cross-examination? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, understanding the cross, understanding the types of questions, um, you know, the attorneys that you work with, often they know where, you know, where the, the other party, uh, you know, what points they're going to try to make and, and they'll advise you ahead of time. Okay. They're going to ask this, they're going to ask these questions and here's your responses. You know, you need to stick to your knitting, stick to your, uh, the details of what it is, you know, yeah. and your safe spot is always your report, right? Mm -hmm. If you go, if you have any doubts at all, you know, go back to your report because that report has been combed over by the attorneys and uh you know they know that that you know anything that's in there is safe right and and that's that's good to know you know you don't want to get out too far outside those boundaries and that's where you get into trouble is when you get outside those boundaries right <laughs> now you talked about um being you know an expert witness depending on where the the country is at the origin of, of the material and whatnot have you been an expert outside the united states for a different country yeah, I was an expert witness uh, in a case in Australia. In fact, it was the very first case that I was involved in. And it, the the rules for expert witnesses are a bit different there. Um, you know, you, you, for instance, in some countries, uh, attorney uh, discussions are are not privileged. You know, you are able to to share them uh, with with the other party. Uh, especially, uh, you know, written communications, especially are, are, are uh, may or may not be protected. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting areas in that case, but I have never actually uh, testified. I've, I've worked on several reports, but never been asked to testify outside of the United States. You do a lot of nationwide expert witness reports mm -hmm. or whatnot too. Have you found that things run a little bit differently, let's say in the California courts than perhaps North Carolina or perhaps Florida? Like, do you have to be certified as an expert witness in the industry that you're in before you can go to another state? What are some maybe hiccups or things that you have to overcome to begin that expert witness? Um, no, I, I haven't really had any experience of having to be you know, certified or what have you. I will say that, you know, I've been involved in a number of cases uh, on the West Coast um, in California that involved, you know, the high tech industry. And, um, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those cases involve patent laws and uh, patent infringement cases. And, the, you know, the issues uh, involve how do you, um, how do you import these products? They call them, you know, accused products uh, into the United States. And the United States is the only country that has these patent laws uh, that that are enforced to this extent, and so uh, it can be challenging because guess what? Most of the electronics produced uh, that are imported in the United States come from Asia, come from China or Taiwan or Japan or Malaysia, what have you. 
and and it can sometimes be difficult to show how these products are actually entering the U.S. and are people aware that they are infringing on patents as they're coming into the United States. Wow. So there's different, um, very different kinds of, um, uh, I, I guess, this, you know, I can't go into the details, but there's there's very different circumstances around how these products enter into the U.S. and how they're imported into the U.S. from these faraway places like Asia. So I think the idea of, of these global distribution networks is particularly important in, in these uh, California tech companies. What about, you know, you mentioned, you know, import from outside countries. Uh, is there usually maybe a translator involved as far as when you're doing the discovery or digging in to try to determine? Is that something that you've come across and you're used to maybe working around? Uh, yeah. In fact, I've, I've had to work with um, a couple of global companies. Uh, I was involved in one case, involved a, a, a large Korean manufacturer. And so there had to be some translation of, you know, both Korean uh, depositions and documents into English. And sometimes the translations aren't always great. I mean, some are good, some are better. <laughs> right. And so, you know, you have to work around those those areas and be, um, you know, be very careful in how you interpret those documents, because sometimes the translation doesn't always carry over. Well, is there anything else you'd like to end with um, about your journey as an expert witness and maybe some next steps that maybe you're looking forward to? You know, I, I'm really enjoying this. It's it's always uh, a journey for me of discovery. I always learn so much about, you know, a particular uh, issue. And as I said, you know, supply chain management is such a broad area. There's so much to learn about, you know, warehouse management, transportation management, uh, contracting, uh, patent law, um, you know, there's many, many different flavors that I get involved in, uh, but they all revolve around supply chains. So um, I'm really, really fortunate that I would, you know, I've kind of fell into this area 30 years ago and uh, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. I enjoy learning every time I get involved in one of these cases. Well, thank you, Robert. Really appreciate your time and have a good rest of your day. You too. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Discussions at Roundtable. Our show notes are available on our website, roundtablegroup.com. Subscribe today on Apple Podcasts or your favorite listening apps. 